Historically speaking, the men that made up armies in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries were often looked on very poorly by society. As career in the army was typical of the second or third born son of a nobleman, as the first born would do more important things like politics or law. The rankers were often mercenaries, drunkards, criminals, or poverty class workers down on their luck. Although many people typically assign this point of view to Britain due to popular depictions, it's more accurate to assign it to nearly all the armies of Europe prior to the French Revolution, including France itself. Talks about conscription and mass formations of soldiers were also taking place in this time period. The ancient regime had a militia system, but it was unequal and not properly set up. It was only given to certain towns and regions of France, typically those where the government had a strong presence. Even then, it was easy to get out of the militia if you were rich and brought a replacement, which is where a lot of the anger surrounding the system arose. The militia would then have its men taken to the main army, but of course, only the poor would go first. This system was being challenged as soon as the Estates General was called in 1789. Du Bois de Crancé called for universal conscription and the abolishment of the militia system. Ironically, the militia system set up to protect the monarchy would be the primary force looking for its abdication, and the so-called treason of these militia members would fuel the ranks of the revolution. Additionally, France's national security was being constantly threatened during the revolution, and the army was unable to do its duty effectively due to mutinies, riots, desertion, and other forms of disobedience. All of these factors led into the formation of the French National Guard in 1789. Units of the Guard quickly spread throughout France, and they sported uniforms similar to the ones of the French Royal Guard under the ancient regime. They wore blue open coats with red cuffs and a white undercoat, and by July of 1790, these units were organized under one cohesive formation and had tens of thousands of men enlisted within their ranks. In that same year, France was reorganized into departments, with each department having its own National Guard and quota of recruits based on its population. In October of 1791, the Guard was reorganized again. In practice, any male over 18 had to join the National Guard. If enough companies were formed together, they were designated as an ad hoc battalion. Artillery and cavalry units were even raised when enough money and equipment was available to have them. This system had just finished its formation when, in 1792, the assembly and the king went to war. Fresh troops and men were called up from across France. This new army was made up of patriotic volunteers, former professional soldiers, and a massive mix of civilians. Conscription wasn't introduced, so the sizes were still quite small compared to how far France would go, but these recruits in 1792 joined for only a period of one year, which would cause horrific problems further down the road. The first year was a mixed bag and ran mostly on luck. The new recruits and fresh volunteers were under-equipped, ill-disciplined, and untrained. Compared to the veteran armies of Prussia and Austria, who had the backing of imperial treasuries and a cadre of officers experienced in warfare, it was quite obvious who was going to win. The French, under General Dumouriez, attempted to invade the Austrian Netherlands, for example, and his men fled at the first battle, even killing a general in their retreat. An Austro-Prussian army under the Duke of Brunswick almost reached Paris, but was stopped at the Battle of Valmy, which was tactically a stalemate and only saw the artillery win the day. This was because most of the artillery was still following the same structure as the old regime, while the infantry was a complete mess. There were minor gains on the German side of the Rhine and in Italy that year, but the campaign ended inconclusively. Desertion, sickness, and combat took its toll, however, and by the end of the 1792 campaign, the army was already looking for more recruits. It would be a whole year until they finally took action that would fix the issue more than any previously proposed plan. After a disaster in the Netherlands, stalemate in Germany, retreat in Italy, Spanish armies crossing the border, and counter-revolutionaries raising men to attack the government in Toulon and the Vendée, the French Republic needed a savior. Their savior would be Lazare Carnot. Lazare was a career army officer who was practically rank-locked at captain in the Royal Engineers due to his status. He was constantly infuriated over how the French army ran itself, especially after the Seven Years' War, and he was determined to change it. On the 14th of August, he was appointed to the military side of the Committee for Public Safety. Numbers for the French army across the revolutionary period range wildly, but it's generally accepted that there were roughly 600,000 soldiers across France in mid-1793. Carnot's massive brainchild was the Levé en masse, or the Mass Levy. This levy called for all unmarried men over the age of 18 to be enlisted into the army. It wasn't even strongly enforced, as the French government had far too many problems on its hand to worry about conscription dodging. However, it worked. Men flocked to join the army throughout the year. The influx was so large that the army was basically entirely reorganized within two months, an impressive achievement which gave Carnot the nickname the Organizer of Victory. These patriotic volunteers, although highly motivated, were completely untrained or disciplined. Therefore, they were all mustered into volunteer battalions, with two of each volunteer battalions being attached to one veteran battalion. 
This would create a regiment, however that term was too tied to the ancient regime to make the revolutionaries comfortable. Therefore, it was renamed the Demi Brigade. To further his goals, Carnot made the armies of the Republic divide themselves into what would eventually become corps. These corps were fast moving and able to strike on the flanks of the enemy instead of risky frontal attacks. With all of these changes, the first test would come at the Battle of Vaticanese, where a French army under Marshal Jordan defeated an Austrian army. He used Carnot's new reorganization, and it's disputed that Carnot even led one of the columns from the front and took them to victory. Regardless, the French armies were now holding their own and able to match the coalition. Under Carnot's brilliant leadership, organizational, and systemic reforms, the army was able to mobilize almost 3 million soldiers in total by the end of the Revolutionary Wars. On top of this, morale and enthusiasm was kept at an all-time high. Officers were in part chosen by election, and they, in turn, supported the soldiers by ensuring their well-being. Subsidies for families back at home and soldiers wounded in the field of battle were extremely generous, again boosting the idea of the citizen-soldier being supported by the entire nation rather than the checkbooks of princes and kings.